And after I left school at 15, he offered me a job. And lo and behold, the first job was right behind me, digging the flower bed and trimming the grass. Lord McFall, it is lovely to meet you. I'm interested to know, to start with, what your childhood was like. What were those early years like? It was just an ordinary childhood in a, in a Clydeside town where it was dominated by heavy industry, engineering and shipbuilding. Very much a working class community where aspiration, mutual obligation and community was very much the watchwords on that. I went to the local schools, I left school early, uh, I then did a range of jobs uh, that took me here, there and everywhere before returning to Dumbarton, age 20. As a young person, I enjoyed my life then, but uh, there was a lack of direction to it and clarity. So when I got back home, that was the time when I changed my approach. You decided to study chemistry. Why did you make that choice and where did you hope it might lead you later? Well, I went into education late and uh, I got a second chance. I uh, went to the local night school with the support and encouragement, again, of Joan, uh, my wife. And I got encouraged at the night school and it was a science teacher, Dan Mitchell, who taught in Vale Leaven Academy, who was really enthusiastic and he encouraged me to go in and do chemistry and I followed that up. So you initially studied chemistry, but there were other subjects that caught your attention as well. I then did a year study of teacher training. I went into teaching in secondary schools in chemistry, and I did a bit of maths as well, because that was part of my degree. But I felt, given the science degree I had, I wanted to get deeper roots in analysis, and I felt that philosophy was a good subject to give me that. It complemented the science that I had. I then, part-time, went to Strathclyde University to do a Master's in Business Administration. That was a three-year degree, doing it at night time. And if I remember correctly, the fees were about seven or £800. Pounds, and uh, that's when my wife and I fell out a little bit. But she was very patient because it denied the family a holiday when I had to pay my fees for the MBA. Whilst you're teaching as your day job, you're also studying on top of that. You then get involved in politics. Talk to me about that. Well, my friends knew that I had very much an interest in political affairs and in society. And one of them, who was a councillor, asked me to join the local Labour Party and become a councillor. And I said, well, I'll be happy to join the Labour Party, but I ain't going to be a councillor. One, that I had a family with four children, and I was in a senior post. So I said that I would go in and assist in the background and I became chairman of the constituency party. And I suppose what I did in that time was that I was able to appeal to the different factors uh, in the Labour Party and try and keep the car on the road. When you became an MP and you're dealing very much with those local wants and needs, what was that journey like? Well. Having lived all my life uh, in the town, people knew me, and that was a great advantage. And in my constituency at the time, uh, one part of the constituency uh, was Helensborough, and it was traditionally uh, a conservative part. So I had to adopt a missionary approach in Helensborough and go out and engage with people, and I did that very successfully. And uh, actually, when the boundaries changed in 2005, I was really very sorry to leave Helensburg because I made so many good friends. So part of that, of course, was about the transition from shipbuilding in the area. What was that part of your life like, helping the community to go through that transition? I was very conscious of the need to regenerate the area. There was a devastation in the area. We had the whisky industry, but we had to do more to engage and regenerate the place. It's a real 
hard slog if you want to change issues in society or in politics. But it is successful because from a base of 430 jobs lost now, the economic development report, which I saw, I think, way back in 2016, was talking about 1,900 full-time equivalent jobs. So tell me about Loman Gate. Well, Loman Gate is a very successful economic redevelopment model. Uh, from the ashes of the closure of the J&B bottling plant to one where well, there's now the BBC, which has a real presence in Dumbarton, where we have Agreco, the generating company, which stayed in Dumbarton and developed there, where we have tills, where we have housing, and where it's located is on the road to Loch Lomond. So it's making Dumbarton a very attractive place and encouraging both inward investment but also people coming to Dumbarton because the location of Dumbarton is very handy whether you're talking about Glasgow on the one side whether you're talking about Loch Lomond. Tell me about the relevance of Duck Bay. Well, Duck Bay was the place where I held annual meetings in aid of ensuring national park status for Loch Lomond. It was the case until the first national park was established in Loch Lomond that Scotland never had any national parks, despite there being national parks in England and Wales since 1947. So it wasn't going anywhere and you had to have legislation for that. We are at Duck Bay Marina Hotel and in many ways this was the successful start for the first national park status for Scotland in Loch Lomond. I held conferences every year for over 10 years and the late owner Bobby Colley was very helpful to me in arranging these. We had people nationally and internationally associated with national parks across. With a bit of struggle it was accepted by the government that they would undertake that. But legislative time ran out and as a result we had to hand it over to the Scottish Parliament. Now, I've worked with Jackie Bailey, MSP, uh, since she was elected in 1998. We shared the same office for 12 years and Jackie and others made sure that that strong message that national park status for Loch Lomond was hugely important was delivered in the Scottish Parliament and it was the first substantial piece of legislation of the Parliament. So I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. What's out there, Jackie? I can't oh, it see. Looks like, it looks like swimmers. It looks like crazy people on Loch Lomond in four degrees. <laughs> I think we should buy them tea. John, it, it, we were blessed to represent such a beautiful area and it was only fitting that your work was continued and recognised in the Scottish Parliament with the passing of the legislation, but, but very proud to carry on the work that you started, John, with the creation of the National Park, the first National Park in Scotland. And if it hadn't been for your efforts all those years ago, we probably wouldn't be standing here now celebrating that fact. Lord Muffal, you were chair of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee. What happens within that committee? What's its job? Well, essentially, the work of the Treasury Committee is overseeing the work of the Treasury and the Chancellor and the Bank of England as well. So, very firm engagement with the Chancellor and the Bank of England. Also overseeing financial companies, banks, insurance companies, whatever. And the third aspect was to build a bridge with the public. Previously, the public would know very little about that because the terminology was so complex. For example, quantitative easing. What does that mean? Essentially, well, it means printing money for the Bank of England and then distributing that. 
Tell me about how you became a member of the House of Lords. Well, I had almost 10 years as uh, chairman of the Treasury Committee and I was standing down in 2010 and a month, six weeks afterwards, I got a call saying that the government were thinking of putting me into the House of Lords to ensure that the experience I had on the Treasury Committee with finance and economics it would carry on into the House of Lords. And given that I really enjoyed that job and that aspect of it, and there was a professional development path there, I became a working peer. You helped to set up the Conduct Committee. Tell me a bit about why that committee is really important. Whilst the members of the House of Lords are not elected, we are accountable to the public. And following the Nolan principles in the 1990s where they outlined honesty, integrity, openness, selflessness, it's very important that the House of Lords demonstrates these qualities to the outside world. And in essence, that was my job as chairing that committee. Your role as Deputy Speaker took you through the whole COVID period. What was that like? You know, we found ourselves in a situation where uh, we couldn't meet at all here. Uh, and therefore, the question is, how can we keep doing our business from home? So the technological issues and problems that we had to face were really considerable. And we also had to rewrite the rules. And that was a real challenging experience. But at the end of the day, I was pleased to see the Guardian newspaper stating that after 750 years of doing things in the same way, eh, this transformation was so successful that the House of Lords pipped the House of Commons at the post. In 2021, you were elected as Lord Speaker. Just explain what that role involves. In essence, the Lord Speaker's job is, first of all, about procedure and the floor of the House. Secondly, it's about the business manager work. For example, we've got R&R &R at the moment. Restoration and renewal is a really important part of our responsibility, and we have that obligation for present and future generations to restore the beauty of this iconic building. The third aspect, though, is to ensure that the good work of the House of Lords and the quality and experience of people here is recognised publicly. And that has been difficult in the past. And therefore, a part of my approach, my manifesto, was to say we need to reach out. And as a result of that, our communication strategy is much wider now. Whilst we are unelected, we have that public duty to explain ourselves to the public. And that's what guides me in that area. You're incredibly committed and driven in your work here in the House of Lords, but your home community is also really important to you, isn't it? Well, from my earliest days, what was instilled in me was neighbourhood, mutual obligation and common betterment. And these values still drive me today. What does it mean to be a son of the rock? Well, son of the rock means being born in the shadow of Dumbarton Rock, Dumbarton Castle, uh, and being proud of the town. After all, it was the ancient capital of Strathclyde in the 4th century. So history matters to us. At Mary Queen of Scots, even Blackadder was in Dumbarton Castle. So we have a long and fine history and that's what Son of the Rock means. And here we see Dumbarton Rock and my title in the Lords is McFall of Alcluith. Yeah. I wanted the simplest title, but I couldn't have it. And I thought, well, let's go back to the 4th century when Dumbarton was the ancient capital of Strathclyde eh, under the kingship of King Seretic. And Alcluith meant rock on the Clyde. And in my representative work, I represented both Clydebank, where the QE2 was built, 
and my hometown of Dumbarton, where the hovercraft was developed in the 1960s and Denny's, and also the cutty sack in the 19th century. So we're actually standing in what was the Danish shipyard, uh, with the boats launching here. And my father worked actually as a plater in Denny's. And uh, I will remember him coming home in the days that they'd launched the ships. Uh, it's so sad nowadays to see that that's all gone and the amount of industry that we lost on the Clyde. And um, that was very much in my mind when I became the managing director at Polaroid, uh, where we were making all those cameras and film. And, uh, I was thinking, under my watch, this is not going to go the way of other companies that have folded in the area. So, John, that was one of the benefits of you working with me and supporting me was to help influence the parent company um, to, to see Scotland as a place to continue to do business when other companies, multinationals, were pulling out. And uh, your contribution there was just immense. Well, I was very much aware of the deindustrialisation that has taken place in our community since the 1960s. So we had to strive to keep employment here, to assist the welfare of the area and to ensure continuing economic prosperity for the citizens. Yeah. What would you say you're most proud of? I think I'm most proud of the fact that I have no sense of entitlement and I strive to keep that but also that I know who I am, I know from where I come from, and I'm kept on the road on that by my wife and my family, and that's really important to me. Well, we're in Leaven Grove Park, which has been a feature of my whole life. Coming here as a boy to play football, putting, playing tennis, and having lazy summer nights with my friends. My parents had a paper shop nearby and the superintendent of the parts department was a regular customer. And after I left school at 15, he offered me a job. And lo and behold, the first job was right behind me, digging the flower bed and trimming the grass. And if you want a definition, of a local man, local person, then it's me. Married to the girl in the next street, living 500 yards from where I was born, the same distance from where I live now. And Dumbarton is very much my home and it will never be anything else.